don't have a class.
Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Vice David Harris. I'm the provost here at Tufts University. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the 33rd annual Norris and Marjorie Benenson Epic International Symposium here at Tufts University. This year we're examining the question, is the liberal world order ending? I want to thank the Benenson family first. I know Bobby and Joanne in the back. I want to thank you for your support of Tufts in general, and specifically today, for your support of the Epic Symposium. Thank you very much. It wouldn't be possible without your support. <laughs> and Norris and Marjorie Benenson, I understand tomorrow your mom will be here, so you yeah. get to meet Marjorie. Um, I want to thank the IGL board. Um, there's several members of the IGL board. I wonder if you just raise a hand or stand up and be recognized. And you're already here. Right here. <laughs> so I have the pleasure of meeting with the board. I think it's four times a year we meet. Um, and you know, one of the things I say, it's my six year as provost, I say the boards, I think about them as IBA, Invest, Bridge, and Advise. And um, this board really does that. When you think about the bridging, they do a fantastic job of spreading the word about IGL around the country and around the world, as well as bringing what they learn back to IGL to help us make IGL even stronger. They do a fantastic job of advising. Um, you know, the meetings are a lot of fun because you have people who are experts in many, many different areas, and they inform what's happening at IGL, sort of picking the annual theme for Epic and so many other things that we do. And then invest. Incredibly generous. And again, just as Bobby Benson, his wife Joanne, Bobby being a member of the board, what happens at IGL wouldn't be possible without support in many ways. So thanks again for all of that. I want to thank the Epic students. Uh, the Epic students were already mixed in up here. So, um, so it's quite a journey you've been on, huh? Did you know what you were getting into fully? Or? No, you didn't. That's the best way to do it. You heard it was interesting, but you weren't quite sure how much it was going to be. Um, but you know, this, would really be, this really would not be possible without all of your hard work, your dedication, your vision, and your courage. And you might think, courage? What do you mean courage? You guys probably know what I'm talking about, which is you've been involved in something where you don't, we want students to be doing at Tufts University, which is you push yourself beyond your comfort zone, intellectual comfort zone sometimes. You've been asked to do things by your colleagues that maybe you thought you weren't sure you could, but you're seeing the fruits of your labor here tonight and throughout the symposium. You've seen it in many other aspects. So thank you for everything you're doing. It certainly would be possible without your hard work. Um, I want to thank all of our visitors here. All of our visitors. It's amazing every year to come and see students and other visitors coming from around the country and around the world for this. And it's part of what makes us really special is not just the panels, which are amazing, but also the conversations that happen around meals in the hallways and so forth. I also want to thank the IGL staff. Um, I know there's a number of others. Yeah, but this Heather's way back there hiding. I see you up there, Heather. So Heather and everyone else from the team, Stacy, I see in the back, and this wouldn't be possible, so thank you very much for coming. <laughs> last and not least, Abby Williams the director in his first year here at IGL as director. This is his first epic as director, but certainly he's seen it before, having been a board member and having been a student at Tufts a little while ago. Um, so Abby's just made a huge impact in his first year. It's been fantastic to have here, for not only for what he's doing for IGL, but for what he's done along with others to really help Tufts, even make Tufts be an even more integrated university. So Abby, thank you for everything you're doing for IGL and for Tufts. This is my sixth year here at Tufts, and um, Epic really is a, quite a special experience. It's the kind of thing that, like the students said, I think until you've experienced it, you don't really know what this is going to be. You don't really understand it, I think. But um, I started to get a sense when I was talking to alums uh, of Epic, and I heard from folks who are doing amazing things now in their professional careers, and what they said again and again is, I am where I am because of my experience in Epic. So maybe you are where you are because of your experience. Maybe those connections with board members, and that was helpful. But what really mattered was is that this was one of the first times, and one of the key times in their lives, when they realized they could do things that they didn't think they could. So when they went off, and I'm thinking one person who's made it big in the media said, you know, I was a young person I, in the media. I can do that. I've done that. And so it's really a fantastic experience. We look forward to the panels today, tomorrow, uh, continuing on throughout the weekend. 
I want to get out of the way and let the real action happen. But uh, excited to be here and excited to have all of you here as well. So thanks. And my last job, it's a pleasure to introduce Lorenzo Lau. And I got to meet Lorenzo a little bit earlier and a few things. He's from California, one of the Epic students, senior. And he's done lots of things. And Lorenzo can do something I can't do. I can't swim. But Lorenzo can. Not like can he swim, but he was a part of recently Tufts NESCAT championship team. So congratulations. Thank you, Provost Harris. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Lorenzo Lau, and I'm a senior at IRMA. Sorry, thank you, Sorry about that. Uh, and thank you, Provost Harris, for those really kind words. So, uh, good evening. My name is uh, Carlos Sirisari, and I'm a freshman at Tufts University. Uh, this past year, throughout my first year in university, I was given the opportunity to join a class which seemed amazing both in quality and in educational level, um, greater than anything I had ever attempted before. And as Provost Harris mentioned, that's really all you know when you join Epic. You don't really know much about what you're getting into. Uh, but one month into my college career, out of curiosity really, I decided to join uh, the class known as Education for Public Inquiry and International Citizenship, or as we call it, Epic. Uh, so far, the class has not only reached, but has far outweighed any expectations I had for it. It's been a truly incredible experience. But at this point, many of you may be wondering what EPIC actually is. Well, EPIC is a year-long class that is open to all majors and all year levels uh, of undergraduate study at Tufts University. That brings together a range of lectures from different areas and levels of expertise to talk about one topic chosen at the beginning. And this year, as you all know, the topic chosen was the possible ends of the liberal world order. In the fall, we had the opportunity to have a roundtable discussion with Mahatma Maharaj, one of the founding fathers of modern day South Africa, as he spoke about protests, both violent and non-violent. It was truly one of the most fascinating experiences of my life so far. This semester, I have the opportunity to spend the next three days discussing issues of international importance with people such as the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, the former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, and many other experienced practitioners and professionals. Furthermore, this class has allowed me to connect with some of the best and brightest at Tufts University. The students in this year's class are truly at the core of my current social and educational experience. From the freshmen that have become some of my very best friends on campus, to the seniors that have given me advice countless times uh, when I really need it. I can safely say that there was no better way to start what I expect will be an amazing four years at Tufts University. As you've heard, we find ourselves here to, today to open the 33rd annual Morris and Marjorie Bendison Epic International Symposium. And as I was looking for a way to introduce it, my thinking process was fairly straightforward. I just want to convey to you all how excited I've been in preparation and how excited I am today for the next few days to come. And the reason is simple, and it's because as confident as I am with my intellectual ability, and I really am, um, and as much as this class has taught me, I can guarantee you all that I know only a minuscule fraction of what the experts that we have brought for you over the weekend know about the liberal world order. We are also joined by university students from all around the world, ranging from Brazil to Russia as well as various other delegations from other countries, and um, our civil and, milita and military relationship group called Allies. We thank you all for coming. Being French, I grew up in an environment that strongly valued the importance of international discourse and uh, discussion, and I am looking over the next few days forwards to having conversations with all of you international students about the aspects of the world we live in today and the aspects of the world we will live in tomorrow. So without further ado, I invite you all over the next few days to soak in the knowledge of people that have both studied and participated extensively in the formation and shaping of the world as we see it today. I invite you to contemplate the biggest geopolitical shift since the fall of the Berlin Wall in this very symposium, the possible end of the liberal world order. And now, my good friend Lorenz Lau.
Hey Carlos, um, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Lorenzo Lau and I'm a senior IR major and member of this year's colloquium. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for our first panel of the symposium, Beyond Borders, Contending with Transnational Challenges. Um, we are very excited that you could join us. We put in a lot of work to organize the symposium and we're excited, we're very excited to share with you all um, over the next three days. Um, this panel brings together uh, a group of uh, experts and professionals with great diversity and a great wealth of experience. Um, in today's world, we face challenges that often span beyond borders. Uh, climate change, migration, and terrorism. Um, climate change has become a growing discourse around the world, especially with the American withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accords. The rise of violent extremism has led to a weakening of borders and complications between states and sub-state actors. Um, this in turn has created migration and refugee challenges. This panel will examine these different, but not entirely disparate issues. Um, this is a, you know, this is a very broad range kind of panel. However, the driving and main question is, will states choose to confront these challenges together, or will they try to get at them at their own separate ways? Um, before I introduce the panelists, um, I'd like to explain how this panel will work. Um, each uh, panelist will give their opening remarks of 12 minutes long, which we have our Andy timer, um, and then they will, um, and then after that, uh, they'll have the opportunity to respond to one another. Um, to which after that, uh, we will open up the panel to audience Q&A. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, uh, up first will be Ms. Samantha Gross. Uh, Ms. Gross is a fellow at the Brookings Institute, institution, and um, her work is focused on the intersection of energy, environment, and policy, including um, climate policy and international cooperation. Um, she was also the director of the Office of International Climate and Clean Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. Next, we have uh, Jonathan Prentiss. Mr. Prentiss is the chief of office in the office of the special representative of the Secretary General for International Migration. What is that? <laughs> um, um, before that, uh, he was the International Crisis Group's director of his London office and a senior advocacy, advocacy advisor. Um, and last but not least, we have with us Professor um, Andy Knight. Uh, professor Knight is the, uh, was a former professor of international relations at the University of the West Indies and is now a professor of international relations at the University of Alberta. Um, and with that, let's go. This microphone in the right place so you all can hear me. So thank you for your kind introduction. I appreciate that, and I, I really think this is an interesting panel. And bringing, I like the way that Lorenzo introduced this in raising the question of these are all very disparate issues, but will we deal with it together or will we try to go it alone? And I think that really brings these disparate ideas together. So it's a nice intro. Um, I also want to throw out something. I'll be quite frank in my talk, and so the opinions that I that I put out are mine. They're not mine. They're not those of my institution or of anyone that I work with. They're they're coming directly from me. Just in case, just it's good to know going out there. But our theme tonight is transna transnational challenges, and I'd like to focus my time on how mistrust of multilateralism and the polarized nature of U.S. politics today make addressing these types of issues particularly difficult in this environment. Um, the Trump administration, as we've seen in spades recently, is extremely skeptical and mistrustful of multilateral agreements, um, viewing them really as sort of a giveaway of U.S. sovereignty. Um, and we've seen this mistrust play out in a number of ways. Um, the trend is very clear in trade policy, particularly today. I mean, we announced um, trade tariffs on aluminum and on steel just today. And you see it in our rejection of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and in the challenges we're having and some of the demands we're making on the renegotiation of NAFTA. Um, you also see it in the, in the tariffs put on Chinese solar panels. It was definitely a, um, you know, the fulfillment of a campaign promise, but also raises challenges for the clean energy industry. Um, we've seen this dislike of multilateralism play out in the U.S. relationship with the United Nations. This administration pulled the U.S. out of UNESCO, which is the U.S. cultural branch, um, because of its stance on Israel. You see us uh, making noise about pulling out of the um, U.N. Human Rights Council. And you saw um, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley talk about taking names of countries that, were that voted in favor of the, of the resolution that opposed the U.S. movement 
of our embassy um, from, uh, into, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And even on security issues, the U.S. has professed a preference for going alone. The Iran nuclear deal is in peril. And you also have seen some contradictory statements, although those have calmed down more recently, uh, from this president about NATO. Um, and none of these institutions is perfect. Um, but in the past, these weaknesses, they've been around for a long time, but the U.S. has really recognized that despite these weaknesses, there are certain kinds of issues that are really best not dealt with alone. And we've understood that it's best to look out for our interests and work and, and you know, work towards dealing with problems from the inside rather than leaving these institutions because they're not perfect. Um, and that attitude has really changed substantially over the last year. And that's, I'd like to focus the rest of my talk talking about how this has played out in the environmental realm. Climate change is really the ultimate transnational challenge. The problem is at the very heart of the modern economy. Um, the change needed is so large that the world needs cooperation across borders. This is something that no country can deal with alone, no matter how large their economy is. And yet, the very reason that climate needs a, transaction, a transnational approach is exactly what makes it so hard to deal with. Um, emissions everywhere have the exact same effect as emissions anywhere else. And the changes needed are really fundamental. So governments have an overwhelming temptation to free ride on others' efforts. So the Paris Agreement was a serious effort to overcome the finger pointing that had happened in the past between the developed and the developing world, and this strong temptation for free riding. And the US was very much in favor of the Paris Agreement's approach. In fact, it was really designed to be something that the US could get behind. Um, so President Trump's announcement in June that the U.S. intends to withdraw from the Paris Agreement was, was really a challenge. Um, we are now the only country in the world that's not behind the agreement. The last two holdouts were Nicaragua and Syria, and they both signed on to the agreement last year. So we're truly going it alone on this one. Interestingly, the U.S. can't officially pull out from the Paris Agreement until the day after the 2020 presidential elections. And I'm not clever enough to make that up. It's a true fact. But, but even now, we're largely, even though we're still in the agreement, we're largely removing ourselves from the important work of implementing it. We came up with the agreement, but how to actually make it work in progress is an ongoing process. Um, at the last climate meeting, which happened um, at the end of November of last year, the U.S. sent a delegation, and that delegation was largely constructive, but it was at a lower level than it had been in the past. It didn't necessarily represent the views of the administration, it didn't have the kind of firepower to really influence the direction of discussions that it might have had if it had been a higher level like they had sent in the past. Um, one of the most frustrating things about the Paris withdrawal overall is that the reasons that President Trump stated seem to be rooted in a misunderstanding of the agreement itself. Um, President Trump's Rose Garden, Garden speech announcing withdrawal was sort of full of old rhetoric and misguided notions about what the agreement was designed to do. The key innovation of the Paris Agreement, that it was set up as a bring your own goals kind of agreement. Um, rather than establishing top-down goals for different kinds of economies, which is what the Kyoto Protocol did, the Paris Agreement invited each country to establish its own goals and to bring those, and those added together became the goals of the Paris Agreement. In the, the parlance of the agreement, these are called nationally determined contributions. And another crucial impact of the agreement is that, that enabled its universal acceptance is that each country's goals are voluntary. There are no enforcement mechanisms if countries don't meet their goals. Only reporting to understand the progress that each country is making towards its goals and perhaps apply a little peer pressure in places where that might be helpful. And the idea behind this structure was to encourage countries to be more ambitious in their goals and to help get all countries on board, including the United States, which had been very opposed to the, the top-down prescriptive approach of the Kyoto Agreement in the past. So President Trump's speech last June described the deal as terrible for U.S. competitiveness, and he complained about China's <coughs> goals compared to ours, um, never mind that each country set its own non-binding goals. So I, I was deeply frustrated with the rhetoric that came out in the speech that day. And I don't see the U.S. moving back towards the Paris Agreement during this administration. 
And the idea that the agreement will be ne negotiated, it renegotiated, is frankly just absurd. Um, no other country has expressed a desire to do this, and literally every other country is on board. Why would the world sort of kowtow to our desires on this um, and be held hostage to our desire to renegotiate when they've all managed to come to a place where they at least agree directionally on what they should be doing? Um, I don't know what the point is of ongoing statements such that we're willing to renegotiate for a better, better deal for the US, but I don't find these realistic or credible. So the Trump administration's actions on multinational agreements particularly Paris, these demonstrate an ongoing challenge of the polarized US political climate. And so many of the agreements and, and, and issues that I spoke about at the beginning of my talk, they're executive actions. Um, some of these actions have always been the purview of the executive branch and have been at the president's discretion. Whereas others of them, like the Paris Agreement, were designed not to be binding treaties so they wouldn't need Senate approval because Senate approval is difficult to get right now. You require a two-thirds majority to approve a treaty. And it's hard to get, frankly, two-thirds of the agreement to agree on a, two-thirds of the Senate to agree on, you know, a, 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 a resolution supporting Mother's Day, let alone like a binding international treaty. And these kinds of agreements, ones that are strictly done through the executive branch, they're easier on the front end. But the problem with them is they, they become subject to the political winds here in the US. As we've seen, an executive action can be undone by the next administration. We've seen a ton of that in the shift from Obama to Trump. And also, the, um, the, there has been a, a change in, in attitude about that. It used to be that we tried really hard as a country to protect a more unified face overseas. And we pulled back from that somewhat to our detriment. And this makes us a terribly unreliable partner for international agreements. Why would another nation cut a deal with us when they understand that a deal that they make with our executive branch can be completely undone when the executive branch changes parties? Um, our unreliable nature has the ability to hurt us in a number of ways. Um, not just environmental, which is what I focus on every day, but in national security, and in intelligence sharing, and trade, as we're seeing play out today. Um, and this is my biggest concern, even though I spend my days thinking about environmental issues. I'm most concerned with this, with this unreliability and the kind of picture that we're putting out to the world. And we're not a partner you can count on in international agreements. I, I find that scary. And when dealing with the issues that the rest of the panelists here will talk about tonight. But to end on a more optimistic note, because this could be kind of a gloomy panel if I see it coming. Um, I want to point out another international environmental agreement that might fare better, and that it will be an interesting one to watch to understand how far the administration is willing to go, and how negative they are towards multilateral agreements. And that's the Kigali Amendments to the Montreal Protocol. Um, these amendments call for nations to begin cutting the use of hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs, since that's kind of a mouthful. These are refrigerants that are used in air conditions and other cooling type appliances. And HFCs replaced the CFCs, the chlorofluorocarbons, that were the main cause of the ozone hole that we all heard about in the 80s. That's truly alarming. Um, but it turns out that these HFCs that replace the ozone depleting chemicals turn out to be very um, potent greenhouse forcing gases, much more potent than CO2 or even methane. So this amendment to the Montreal Protocol, even though that's really been an ongoing agreement about the ozone layer, this one's really about climate. But the U.S. has been really positively disposed towards the Kigali Amendments. A State Department official at a big U.N. meeting about this back in November and was singing the praises of the, of the Kigali Amendments. And the reason why is that the U.S. is a leader in developing substitutes for HFCs. And it's also true that the U.S. manufacturing sector is very heavily in favor of the Kigali Amendments because they want, they want market certainty and they want to understand what kind of products they can sell in different places. So it's their advantage to have the world unified around this, among this single standard. It's also true that the Montreal Protocol um, has some real conser conservative bona fides. It um, originated in the 1980s um, with Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher heavily in favor. And so there are some real conservative icons that, that actually helped put this agreement in place. 
And the Montreal Protocol has been one of the most successful multinational environmental treaties of all time. It's been wildly successful. Um, partially because replacements for CFCs got cheap and so, environment, and so compliance got cheaper. But it's really worked. The ozone hole is healing rapidly and it's a true environmental success. So the Senate needs a two-third vote, two-thirds vote to approve the Kigali Amendments. And we'll see what happens. The Senate has approved, ooh, I'm getting close, the Senate has approved four other amendments to the Montreal Protocol over the years and the original agreement had passed unanimously back in the 80s. So it's precedent. But the fate of Kigali and how this all turns out will be very telling in this environment of trust under multilateralism. I mean, in many ways, it's an ideal agreement. Um, it, has, it has a conservative background to it. Industry is highly in favor of it. But the flip side is it deals with climate, which is an issue that this administration has been a little dicey about. And it's also a binding multilateral treaty, which is also something this administration has been so I really think what happens with the Kigali Amendments over the next year or so is something to watch, to see how it plays out in this administration. And if it goes well, I think it's a positive sign for our ability to continue to engage with the world on these issues. If it doesn't, I think that's a negative. And I think that's something that we, that we should really watch for. So with that, I'll give the rest of my time back, and I look forward to questions and conversations. Looking time box, and I was relieved to see. I was relieved to see that when the 12-minute uh, mark is reached, it doesn't explode in your face. So get ready. I'm just going to talk for ages now. I know. That. Um, but, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to, to thank the Provost, my old friend um, Abby, who I think was was behind my participation here. I'm very pleased to see you again, um, Lorenzo. Thank you for, for bringing us. Uh, together. I'm going to start also with the same disclaimer um, that Samantha started with anything foolish or outrageous I say, I say in my own capacity. Uh, all the rest uh, I can say in my function as a, a, a UN fonctionnaire. Um, the structure of this panel is, is, is really well thought through. Whoever, whoever amongst you or whichever group of you thought this through, I think you did a, a really good job in picking uh, challenges that, that do meet, I think, the criteria of, um, of challenging uh, a group of nations at a time, again, uh, to, to follow on from what Samantha said, at a time when multilateralism is, is, you know, at, I don't know if it's at its most fragile, but it is soft around the edges at this point in time, uh, and that should be something that concerns uh, us all. Um, really the challenge of securing cooperation on, on these types of cross-border issues in such a climate uh, is, I think, one of the signature issues of our time. Which brings me to my issue, migration, which I think is exact, uh, a classic um, example of this. It is potentially uh, a good news story. The, the issue that I work on, the, the precise issue that I work on, work on, which I won't talk about in my comments, but I'll be happy to discuss in, in Q&A or in our chit chat after, is the aim by the membership of the United Nations, 192, the US did pull out of this, but 192 are engaged in a process right now to develop a global compact for safe, orderly, uh, and regular migration. Really a framework for cooperation uh, at a time when the world is crying out for cooperation uh, on issues such as this. Um, uh, and as long as that is uh, moving forward, and it is moving forward, um, I think we have good reason for hope on this issue. Not that it will be easy. But I'm a gloomy person, so I'd like to focus more on the challenges uh, around migration uh, and through them identify what I think some of the potential um, solutions <coughs> might be. Um, and a few words of context, if I may, when I'm laying out what it is I'm talking about when I'm talking about um, migration. Uh, firstly, 
it's a phenomenon, I'm talking about international migration, the movement across of people across borders, um, has occurred really since time began. Now that doesn't endow it with any inherent virtue, but it does suggest that it has staying value. Secondly, there is a normative basis for it, or at least half a normative basis. There is a human right. It is in the human rights framework to leave your country. The problem is, the fundamental problem is, there is no corresponding right to enter another country. Uh, it has a normative basis also in the context of refugees. We've enshrined additional protections for refugees, who are, of course, a form of migrant. And this is most particularly under the 1951 uh, Convention. There are no equivalent regimes either for forced internal migrants, internally displaced persons, nor legal regimes for migrants who do not meet the definition of refugee under the 1951 Convention. And as an aside, and I think it's relevant in the context of discussing the liberal world, or world order, this schism between those who do deserve legal protection by crossing borders and those who don't is to some extent a reflection of the schism that appeared during the Cold War between those who were advocating uh, very actively in favor of civil and political rights, largely the West, uh, and essentially a refugee status is those whose civil or political rights have been infringed or risk being violated, uh, and those who are much more concerned with the defense and promotion of economic, social, uh, and cultural rights, which to some extent of the rest. So I think the epithet of it is often an epithet that if you're not a refugee, you're an economic migrant to some extent has its roots uh, in, the, in this history. Migrants are proportionately a small segment of the global population, though growing. They're about 3.4% of, of our world population. It's statistically traditionally been around 2.7, 2.8% remarkably stable there. Uh, uh, and finally, uh, well not finally, I'm nowhere near finally, I don't know why I said that. Uh, uh, migration is overwhelmingly positive for all concerned. I won't bombard you with statistics, but I'll, I'll throw out a few that I think are particularly illustrative. Uh, migrants typically spend 85% of what they earn in their country uh, in which they live they send back 15% home in the form of remittances. Now these remittances, what migrants send home to developing countries, amount annually to $450 billion a year. That is three times the total ODA that the world spends. These are the poor implementing the SDGs for the poor. It's quite a remarkable statistic that. Migrants proportionately have higher employment than indigenous populations, lower criminality rates, to give you other examples. They are overall net contributors to their communities that host them. Migration is also a byproduct of development. Let's be very clear on this. People have more means to move. If you are the poorest of the poor, you lack the capacity to move. People are dying less. And also, migration, and this is a, a uh, professor in uh, Amsterdam has made this point, I think, very eloquently. Migration is also a byproduct of liberalization. There's a certain, he calls it a liberalization paradox in this, that certain elements of our economic liberalization, for example, the erosion of labor rights, the rise of flexible work, uh, and the privatization of formerly state-owned companies have increased or have contributed to the increase in the demand of labor, of migrant labor in many developed uh, parts of the world. So why this heated debate around migration in places that I think one would typically say are at the heart of the traditional 
uh, liberal world order. This is terrifying. I can see you've seen this clock, and I'm hardly into my uh, comments. Um, and I <laughs> don't worry, I won't go. Uh, and I would suggest that there's a coagulation of factors out there. One is the developed world faces an aging population. That should be a call to more migration, but it can actually have a reverse effect and, and, and frighten societies, intimidate societies. Secondly, I think the financial crisis, the aftershocks of the financial crisis of 2008, um, were deep, were profound, uh, and continue to exist in making certain societies that felt themselves to be strong and dominant more fragile and more inward looking. Uh, in the case of Europe, I think it's very interesting, there has been a softening of its borders, really for the first time since 1945. Um, and also the beginning of a reverse flow of migration. Traditionally, Europe was a net contributor of migrants, it is now receiving uh, more migrants. Disillusion with forms of external engagement, some of the military endeavors in their near abroad didn't go so well. Um, conflict, again, on their near borders is much more complex. It's much more febrile. Um, we have been now living for a generation in a world that has not yet got to grips with, and in some, in, to, I would say with catastrophic consequences, with notions of counter-terrorism. Now, the current fashionable phrase is countering uh, violent extremism, uh, and I think these have had profound consequences um, uh, as well. And there has been dangerous politics that has been brought to bear uh, in these fragile times. The net result has been, I think, a polarizing debate uh, in, in, in both directions, I would say. that this, it, it, it would be wrong to view this polarization um, uh, simply simply as, it's only reductive and simplistic to assume that anyone who expresses concerns over migration uh, is a xenophobe. It's unfair, it's, it's inaccurate, it's simplistic. Um, uh, it fails to realize that this debate is broader than a mere collection of data points. Uh, equally, I think we would be remiss not to draw the link between a vein of rhetoric that is out there that is alienating, dehumanizing, and alarmist with the rise of intolerance in many societies. 56 seconds to uh, provide you with some solutions. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay, so what is to be done? be very quick here where we can talk about it more um, in the conversation. First, figure out what the goal is. Is it to end migration or is it to manage it? I would suggest, and the purpose of the Global Compact is it's to better manage it. Now, there are important consequences that stem from that. Um, one is you can have a more honest discussion on what your labor needs are and how external labor markets might be able to fill them. Uh, secondly, you could have a more honest discussion of what the root causes are, because the root causes of migration are very different from the root causes of irregular migration. You want to be able to stem the irregular movement of people uh, and encourage them to move in a uh, regular and safe way. 23,000 migrants uh, have died since 2014. Um, uh, in, in attempting to, to move from one country um, uh, to another. And you also need to be clear-eyed when you're looking at these root causes about the role of development. Um, as I said at the outset, it is far from clear that development actually tamps down migration. On the contrary, there is a significant amount of data to suggest that it encourages uh, uh, migration. Secondly, get a grip on the issue. Understand its scale. It's not as big as all that. Secondly, understand that it is global. This is not a unique challenge for the liberal world order. The vast majority of migration takes place elsewhere uh, around the world. And understand that the challenge really is to address migration's pathologies. 
uh, rather than migration uh, it, itself. I think I'll leave it there. I've got a minute and ten over. I'd like to carry on, but uh, there's enough to begin with. Thank you, Mr. Prentice. Uh, now over to you. Okay, so I just want to thank uh, the Provost for, uh, for, for his introduction to us and also Abby Williams for ensuring that we became invited to this event. And I was going to say that Abby Williams and I go way back to the days of the creation of the Academic Council of the United Nations System. Um, we had, had a workshop at Dartmouth College, I believe it was, um, and we were two very young at the time uh, participants in that workshop, and um, and uh, we've been made friends over the years, and I want to thank you for, for having me here tonight. And I also want to thank the panelists, uh, my, my co-panelists, uh, because they set the stage for me, um, and what I'm, going to have, what I'm going to say here tonight. First of all, I want to focus on SIDS. Does anyone know what SIDS mean? Small island. Small island. Small island developing states, right? Why do I want to focus on SIDS? Well, because the liberal order is supposed to be an order to benefit small island developing states, states that are vulnerable, that are more vulnerable than, than most other states. Um, and we have to question whether or not that, to, that is the case today. So I want to tie it into your main, to your main theme about the liberal order perhaps vanishing in the 21st century at the time when we really do need, desperately need elements of the liberal or world order. And I want to connect it to this notion that many of the problems of small island development states uh, are intermestic problems. They're not necessarily global problems. They're not necessarily domestic problems. The line between the international and the, and the, and the local have become so blurred as to make these problems very complex and difficult to manage. And I like what um, Jonathan was saying just now about uh, migration being a global problem. And I asked myself, is it really a global problem? Or is it really an intermestic problem? In the sense that the lines are so blurred, sometimes we don't know which institutions of world order are supposed to address the problem of migration. Should we be using domestic institutions, regional institutions, global institutions to deal with this problem? So I just that sets the stage for what I have to say. And I'm going to do a, a trick that some of my colleagues, uh, my more senior colleagues uh, do when they give talks like this and they're, and they're faced with a 12 minute limitation. And that is to start with my conclusion first. So that if I don't get there at the end, uh, you at least know what I was going to conclude with. And the basic conclusion is that global security and global governance two essential elements of the post-1945 world order, which essentially had liberal principles embedded within them. These things are necessary today because of threats and the vulnerabilities of especially small island developing states are, are such that it cannot be contained within a national border. States cannot deal with these problems on their own. They have to sort of deal with them collectively. And the interconnectedness of the threats, the inter interconnectedness of the vulnerabilities, uh, is what makes this much more complex and much more difficult to address. And that's uh, one of my colleagues, Ramesh Thakur, actually made that statement in a recent publication. And uh, the problem is that the governance of these problems have to be done not just at one level, but at multiple levels simultaneously. And this is the point that's been made recently by Amitav Acharya, who speaks about this new order that's emerging from the 
the so-called liberal order has been a multiplex order. Multiplex order, not necessarily a, 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 multi, uh, a, a, a multipolar order, but a multiplex order. Now, why do I want to stick with the Caribbean and small states? Because I recently spent four years in the Caribbean as a director of the Institute of International Relations, as, the, as, uh, as Lorenzo pointed out. Um, many of the Caribbean countries have done relatively well economically. They've, mo they've moved from poverty-stricken countries to, in some cases, middle-income countries. And we've seen recently that it takes a, just a series of devastating natural disasters to, to push their economic progress back many, many years. And this is why they are so vulnerable. These are small, mostly island states, uh, in which a single hurricane can undo years and years of development and plunge relatively prosperous households in any Caribbean country back into poverty again. We've seen this almost with Dominica, some of the small islands that suffered through the recent hurricanes. The almost perpetual bombardment of natural disasters in the Caribbean, I use that as a focus because it was there recently. And the hurricanes, tsunamis, the storms, the mudslides, floods, earthquakes, volcanoes, and droughts. This is what makes the Caribbean states so vulnerable. And it poses not just a threat in terms of their economic development, but also raises the issue of whether or not these countries can actually withstand the manifold uh, these, these manifold threats, and whether or not those threats are going to become as, as essential in nature. In other words, are these countries ever going to, to maintain themselves and survive after, after these threats? So even for those Caribbean states that have managed to, to, to transition from low-income countries to middle-income status, they have problems getting official development assistance, and sometimes concessional finance, because the international community made it fairly difficult for them um, to, 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 to be defined in a way as to allow them to get that, that kind of financing to help them through. The manifold vulnerabilities of Caribbean states are compounded by the negative impacts of globalization on these countries. And we know globalization is like a two-edged sword. There are benefits of globalization, but there are also devastating negative impacts of globalization as well. And Caribbean states' uh, economies are highly susceptible to external economic shocks. Their domestic markets are much too small to entertain the possibility of, economic, of economies of scale. Their economies are subject to currency speculation, and they lack competitiveness to truly integrate into the global economy. These countries have a high dependence on imports and produce a very limited number of goods for export. And the widening trade and current accounts and deficits of these countries combined with the massive accumulation of external debt and a very high level of consumer spending further ensures that the Caribbean countries uh, increase their vulnerability to unexpected external economic shocks. Borrowing external capital to address the setbacks of natural disasters, for example, and diverting budgetary, budget, budgeted funds from other social concerns within the country to cope with the critical infrastructural problems that happens as a result of these natural disasters only adds to the, 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 the very bleak picture of these countries. And if, as if this is not enough, Caribbean region as a whole now suffers with some of the highest rates of crime, conflict, insecurity, social and economic inequalities in the world. So the intensification of globalization has no doubt provided abundant opportunities for the, for the regionalization and the internationalization of criminal activities all over the world, and the Caribbean is no exception. As I said to my students uh, in the class just uh, yesterday, uh, the vehicles of globalization, which can bring so much good to certain countries, can also be used to bring a lot of bad <laughs> into countries, like Trinidad and Tobago, where it was uh, recently. 
um, the, the scale of drug trafficking, money laundering, human trafficking, as well as illicit sale in small arms and light weapons. The porousness of the borders of Caribbean states are in large part responsible for the increase in the trans-border criminal activity that we see uh, there. Criminal organizations operating in the Caribbean have in some cases penetrated institutions like the police force, the judicial system, prison system, and even political parties and bureaucratic establishments. And there's a great need for security sector reform. I used to think that well, security sector reform is limited to countries in Africa that are going through civil conflicts. But there are countries in the Caribbean with low intensity conflicts that also require security sector reform. In the, in the time that I have left is one minute and 36 seconds. I want to focus attention on a very serious security problem, which I think Jonathan mentioned in passing, but I think it's very important for the Caribbean, and not a lot of people know about this. And that is the problem of homegrown violent extremism. Why? Because in Trinidad and Tobago, where I was, there were 200 foreign fighters fighting on behalf of ISIS in Syria and Iraq. Here's a country that's known for its carnival, and we just finished carnival just recently, a, a fun-loving country. And yet still there are so many people in that country that have embraced ISIS and embraced the, the ideology of hate perpetrated by ISIS to the point where some of them have decided to go and fight on behalf of ISIS and die on, on, on behalf of ISIS. So there's another problem we have to address, and that is the issue of how do we uh, manage to assist those countries in the Caribbean with very little capacity to address these kinds of problems, very little security intelligence, uh, very little border security. How can we help them uh, to, 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 to be able to reduce the level of violent extremism in those countries. I would, I would say, suggest that the liberal order, the, the embedded principles of the liberal order, would be one way to do so. But, as our panelists have been saying, that liberal order is under threat right now. I leave it there. Professor, um, at, this, at this point, um, I'd like to open it up to the panelists to ask each other questions that they may have. One of the things I'm, I'm just come back on the um, on the. TV on the violent extremism issue, just to sort of mix things up a, a little bit, is um, yes, the, the liberal world order, I think, you know, broadly understood, may have a part in the solution. It has also been part of the problem as well. The, the single minded focus, I think, on counter terrorism um, uh, as a a focus of foreign policy has had, it has been understandable in its root, but it has had some very dangerous consequences in how it has been um, carried out. I think seeing any enemy of the state, wherever that state is, as a terrorist, has been um, inimical to effective peacemaking, conflict management in many uh, situations and I think the focus on violent extremism in some situations, foreign terrorist fighters is a slightly different thing uh, because they can't hurt them. Uh, so it's, big, it's a national security issue. But seeing violent extremism as the source of the problem, when in fact it tends to bolt itself onto the problem. There was relatively little violent extremism in Iraq or in Syria until the conflicts were well uh, developed. Um, I think um, is something that bears thinking about, certainly, I, I, would, I would suggest. If I may respond to that, um, 
you're absolutely, I think you're absolutely right about the fact that this is, a, again, another a two-edged sword in a sense, uh, the liberal order, because it has created this, uh, this, this blowback, if you will. And um, I think the, the challenge then is to try to see uh, what methods should be used uh, within those countries that ha are developing violent extremists uh, to try to address not the surface of the problem, but the underlying reasons why individuals want to become violent extremists in the first place. And I think this is a challenge for any government in, in the region. I know in Trinidad, the government has not has failed to deal with the underlying sources of the problems that cause individuals to, to gravitate towards violent extremism. Those sources lie in things like marginalization, exclusion, feeling as though you're not part of the society. You have to be able to bring them into the society, and I think this is one of the biggest challenges for those governments. They, they, they've had difficulties in trying to, to, to address underlying causes, and maybe the focus of the liberal order ought to be on precisely that, dealing with the underlying sources as opposed to putting band-aid solutions that simply make the problems worse. This, um, I'll, I'll let you in on the conversation. Now, Jonathan and I were having, and Andy's clearly in the same place, until we realized the mics were hot and then we got a little more quiet. But um, this is really all about all the issues we're talking about and the, and the decaying of, of the liberal world order in general, I think, is really about just a real disaffected people, and people who are, who are very disillusioned with the idea of globalization. I think everything that everyone up here has talked about, it, it has its roots there. You see countries pulling inward. You see them yearning for a simpler, less globalized age. It comes out in terms of, of trade protectionism. It comes out in terms of um, not wanting bond agreements with other countries, not wanting migrants. Um, disaffected people sort of finding outlets for their unhappiness be that political movements are actually joining violent extremism. And I think that's kind of the thread that binds us all together, and I'm 100% in agreement with you. I've seen a lot of solutions in this country, and not just for Republicans, I don't want to sound like a raging partisan, but Democrats too. I don't think anybody wants to address the root of this problem, and that is that globalization, not just in this country, but around the world, has really left a certain population of people behind. And the benefits of globalization are easy to see, but I don't think we've necessarily done enough for the people who've been left behind for globalization. And I think that's the threat that binds us and all of us up here together today. And it's in, in that context, um, come back to migration, my subject. Um, it, it's interesting that migration found its way into the UN for the first time under the, the chapeau of the Sustainable Development Goals, and it is it housed in the Sustainable Development Goal that focuses on addressing inequalities within and between states. Uh, and I think a lot of these issues that we are talking about, the challenges to the liberal world order, I think really are being exposed um, by different strata um, uh, of inequalities uh, and inequities, which I think are really imperative. So at this point, we'd like to open up the discussion to the audience. Um, there are two mics on each side of the aisle. Um, we'd ask that if you have a question, please uh, line up behind the mics. And uh, for the sake of time, please ask, please limit yourself to one question for one panelist. Um, I guess while you guys are lining up, uh, I guess I'll, I'll be selfish and get started. Um, I was wondering, I just directed it at, at, at all of you, uh, at all of the panelists. Um, Ms. Gross pointed this out um, with, like, the I guess the lack of credibility that the U.S. Uh, has been espousing recently, in, uh, over like the past two decades, um, since the United States acted multilaterally in Iraq, and with most like I guess very recently, um, the withdrawal or the almost withdrawal of the of the from of the U.S. from the Paris Peace Accords, um, how and obviously the U.S. is like such a leader in, in world affairs. Um, and the liberal world order, um, how can we go about restoring credibility in American actions and, and proving that we are still, I guess, uh, fit to, to lead this order? I'll start because my answer is really, really short. Uh, we have to walk the walk and we have to be reliable. We have to make agreements and stick to them. 
Um, and I think the polarized environment in this country makes that more challenging. And I don't think it's really sunk in yet that this is a problem. The fact that, that our face to the world keeps changing. I, I, I don't think we've realized how much of a problem that is. And until we do, I think it may be difficult for us to be reliable and walk the walk and, and become a reliable partner. Uh, Mike, you're you know, these issues aren't going to go away, uh, and politi domestic politics changes. There's ebbs and flows in different strands, so what seems permanent in 2018 is not going to seem permanent in 2020, 2022. So I just want to, you know, put that out there as a general self-evident observation, but it makes me feel better to um, uh, remind myself of that. And also to point out the fact that, yes, these are interesting times in your country and how it's projecting itself in the world, but it does remain a major global player. It is a major funder of all of these multilateral institutions that um, uh, that I work with, that you study and focus on, and I think it shows every signs of, of, um, uh, of um, continuing to remain so committed. I think these issues are going to speak themselves and they're going to speak more eloquently than any number of panelists can. These are issues, as said at the outset, you chose this, you structured the content of this panel very well. These are issues that cannot be resolved unilaterally. That's a very, very powerful motivating factor towards a multilateral, cooperative, collaborative approach. Can I, can I answer this question using a slightly different tack? And that is to take it to uh, sort of um, um, elevate it to a theoretical plane, if you will, a conceptual plane. Um, world order, world order, the structure of world order has fundamentally three planks, three pillars, if you will. One is ideas. The ideas that sort of propel the world order in the first place, right? The second is the institutions that are created when a new world order comes into being. And those, that, those institutions have embedded with them, in them the ideas that are dominant at the time. And the third pillar is the material capability, the capacity to do something within those institutions the capacity to do something with the ideas. So you have these three elements, if you can think about it that way. What we're witnessing right now is a, a shift in world order, I would, I would argue, from the 1945 world order that was brought in, essentially, uh, by the United States, which was at the time the most dominant power in the international system, whose ideas were embedded within the UN Charter. You look at the UN Charter, you see a lot of it that's sort of very familiar to many Americans, because you can find it in your own constitution, some of those ideas. The liberal ideas were embedded within the institutions that were created in 1945, the post-World War II institutions. And those institutions basically reflected the dominance of the hegemon at the time, the United States. The capacity to do something with it, the United States, as, as Jonathan mentioned, is still very much, you know, they're still very much paying the, the, the paying for the institutions and paying for the work of the institutions. Uh, hegemony comes with responsibility and there's economic responsibility. Uh, you can't be the hegemon and not bear that responsibility. What we're witnessing now is a hegemon that's failing, a hegemon that's losing its hegemony, I would argue. And as a result, the ideas that they used to support, they're not even going against some of those ideas. And the institutions that they used to support, they are no longer supporting in the way that they used to. So maybe this is a temporary thing. Let's hope it's just temporary. Let's hope it's just a Trump thing. Uh, that's a that big elephant in the, in the room here. But I think it went beyond before Trump. It started before Trump. This decline in US hegemony. There are other states that are obviously uh, clashing with the United States in terms of uh, positioning themselves uh, to take a leading role within the international system. China is one of them, but it's not the only one. And I think this is a sign, a signal,
uh, maybe our world order, the structure of the, 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 the world order is undergoing some sort of shift and we're living through it right now. We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know what the post uh, order is going to look like. But certainly, there is that many tensions in that system, in that structure. And because the ideas are shifting, the institutions are not being supported in the way that they should be, and other alternate institutions are being created, and the, the material capabilities are not always given to support the institutions as well. Thank you. Also, I forgot to add this. Uh, before you give your questions, please identify yourself. Could, so, I, uh, Mr. Davies, uh, could I follow up? My question is actually directly related to that. Um, thank you, Dr. Knight. Uh, my question is related to in looking at the current multinational organizations and because in the time that they were created and the circumstances they were created, and you all commented on how it's very different now, changing materials, changing powers, how do you see the role of the existing multinational organizations changing or the need for new multinational organizations or possibly more um, nations working more kind of individualistically in, you know, as we're seeing with like trade agreements, more kind of silo. I'm being very quick, but I oh, want John. John. Hi, John. I John. Uh, I'm going to be very quick on this uh, on this one, but I'm going to go back to what I said about Amitabhacharya and this notion of multiplex or world order. That we're sh the shift really that's taking place is away from multilateral world order to a multiplex world order, in which the the players aren't necessarily nation states always. There there are non-governmental organizations. There are private sector institutions that have the capacity to, to deal with some of the problems that we're dealing with. Um, they just need to have the, for, the, the, the institutional framework in which to operate. So I think what's happening is that we're, we're operating now in a multiplex uh, world order. That's the shift that's going on. And, uh, and therefore, it's going to mean that we're going to have to think differently about how we solve some of these problems. We may not be able to depend on nation states any longer to, to solve these problems, even working collectively. We may have to have public-private partnerships at a global level to address some of these problems because some of the private actors are much more uh, you know, substantial in terms of their material capability than sometimes some of the states. So that would be one way to, to look at this, is to think of this as a transitional moment in history. And we've, we've gone through these transitional moments before. I mean, they, they, going from the medieval period to the Westphalian world order, that was a transitional moment. It changed the whole nature in which the international system operated. The state system became the, the dominant actor within international politics at that point, away from the city state and etc. So if we've gone through this just before, there's no reason why we can't imagine us going through another transition like this one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Safi Mai from the University of Haifa, Israel, and my question is mostly to Ms. Brown, but to anyone else uh, present it's more than more than happy to hear you. So I will use Professor Knight's tactic and I'll just cut to the chase and if the example of my explanation would be needed, I will just add it. My question is if the withdrawal of the United States from the Paris Accords is actually a symptom of the United States losing its leadership, at least in the environmental area. So can I give an example or explain myself? Well, I would like to address uh, nuclear security and specifically the uh, Mox Savannah River facility. It was, um, as far as I remember, they were cancelled after several promulgations. The accountant office actually said that it was just hemorrhage and money, so it should be closed. Or either solve that problem or close it. And this continued, the hand for the the amount of concerns, and all that stuff made me, made me kind of feel that the, whether from political or economical reasons, the United States has difficulties to project its power as a global environmental leader and the uh, rubble from the Paris Accords is just a symptom. I would, um, I think I might actually separate those two examples. I feel like the U.S. has a bit of a love-hate relationship with nuclear. We can't quite decide. We generally like the idea of nuclear power. We like that it's carbon-free, those who care. Um, 
But the challenge is nobody wants it nearby. Nobody wants the waste nearby, nobody wants the plants nearby. And so that, I think, is an ongoing challenge that's quite different from the changing attitude towards environmentalism that we've seen in this administration from the last. Um, I think that's an ongoing issue. And so you'll see this administration pushing more for Yucca Mountain. Um, I'm not sure. I think they're actually the ones that wanted to cancel the Savannah River Mox facility. Um, but I think there's generally a, a real mistrust of nuclear that way predates the current trend. And as far as the U.S. and environmental leadership, I mean, it's a really interesting one. Um, I don't necessarily think that we're trying to change our attitude towards environmental leadership. I don't think anybody, up to and including Scott Pruitt, wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to mess up the environment today. But I think this administration has a real mistrust of, um, of regulations and really is focused on markets. And they're like, these are, these are problems that markets can solve and regulating is generally an inefficient way of dealing with things. And so that I think is the way that, I think it's a combination of our mistrust of regulations and our mistrust of multilateralism that is being projected out into the world as a general um, pulling back on the environment or pulling back on leadership in the environment. But I think it's not so much rooted in environmental attitudes as it is these two fundamental attitudes towards regulation and multilateralism that you're seeing right now. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Hi, my name is Julia, and I'm from Brazil. Um, I study law. My question is to Mr. Gross and Mr. Prentiss, and it's regarding um, environmental refugees. So I wanted to get your take on environmental refugees and if you think that you know, moving forward that's going to be a transnational problem. I believe that it's going to be a problem that the country will have to deal with, especially on um, climate change as countries um, get small countries, sometimes people have to migrate because of the rising water. And what do you think would be the best way to deal with that if you think um, the refugee definition, the classic definition will have to be sort of changed to include those people or if they fall into another category of migrants? Um, good question. Uh, I think also uh, Andy it applies heavily to the small island states uh, uh, question. Can I just say something, not, nothing to do with that question, but just some of the other questions and discourse. Again, I suspect it's self-evident, but I'm going to say it anyway. We should not conflate the liberal world of order with the US. There is overlaps, but that's all. So when we discuss threats to the liberal world order, it shouldn't be reduced to, is the US as powerful as it was yesterday? I just want to put that out there. Environmental refugees is going to become an issue. It is complicated. It is complicated for a number of reasons. One, you intimated that. They, there is no such category of refugees, uh, of environmental refugees. And indeed, I think when you look at a lot of the roots of multilateralism, the, the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights in the 1951 Refugees Convention that I, I mentioned in um, my woefully incomplete comments, um, Try drafting them today. We wouldn't get anywhere near the high principle uh, and protective elements and aspiration uh, that the drafters had back then. So I say this because I think the notion, which you weren't suggesting, of reopening the Refugee Convention up to redefine it, to broaden it, may actually <laughs> backfire. Um, but what this issue, and I think there are other issues as well, it is as yet unclear how many uh, people migrate solely because of environmental factors. In fact, what research is out there tends to suggest, which I think is intuitively makes sense, that it's a confluence of factors and motivations that, that compel people uh, or encourage people to move. And this comes to my last point is you know, it, what is the, you know, around notions of voluntariness. It's clear if you're a refugee, you're not moving for voluntary reasons. Uh, and then, as I said in my comments, 
the automatic, the popular epithet is if you're not a refugee, you're an economic migrant. And that carries with it certain pejorative connotations, that you're seeking a better life because you feel like it, uh, that you want to queue barge, you want to take jobs from, from, from other people. And it strips any notion or subtlety of motivation or compulsion um, out of uh, that individual's decision to move or not. And one of these factors is, of course, going to be, in many instances, the environment. I suspect it's going to be dealt with for the foreseeable on a very ad hoc basis. For example, in some of the Pacific Island states, that many of them already have dual nationality with Australia, for example. New Zealand just announced it was going to um, issue humanitarian visas to some of these small island states in its neighborhood precisely um, uh, for these reasons. But it is going to be one factor amongst many that is simply going to contribute to what I, have, I think we've all been saying is that this issue, migration, not going away. In fact, if anything, the indicators are it's going to intensify. I add a question that sort of goes on what you said. I'm sorry to answer your question with a question. I think, it's, I think I'm going in the right direction here. I kind of hear you saying that actually the way the charter is, is, is now we're unlikely to get anything that's, that's better and more functional. And perhaps given the continuum between refugees and economic migrants, that's not a, a zero one thing. That's a continuum, clearly. And the environmental refugees, environmental migrants, clearly a lot on that continuum, just like the kind of migrants in the system. Yes. I, I, I mean, I agree with this. What, what I'm talking about is entrenching in treaty law. I think you would be very hard pressed to get an expansion of the refugee definition and possibly foolhardy to go down that route. Uh, without getting into a discussion of refugee law, because I'm not really equipped to do that. There has, inevitably, since 1951 and since the 67 protocol, there has been an, an expansion of subsidiary protections. And in fact, you could look at some of the, the, the regional arrangements, like from your region, the Cartagena Declaration, that allowed you know, generalized violence to become um, uh, a refugee cause. That's not in the 1951 Convention, So you can see either on a regional basis or as a matter of customary international law and practice, this definition being uh, opened up. I was talking about as a matter of uh, hard treaty law at the multilateral level, difficult to see it happening uh, anytime soon. Thank you very much. Hello. Um. Firstly, thank you so much for the interesting panel. My name is Arthur Hargan, and I'm a first year student here at Tufts. I'm part of the Epic Olympia. So this goes off from the first question, which John maybe asked. But so as you as you all mentioned, the United States is the joint from Paris Peace Accords, uh, so Paris Paris Climate Accords, Global Compact, and about and various other things. And at the same time, we see nations like China, Russia, adopting the very same economic and political institutions in the way ahead. Considering the different value systems of this multiplex order, do we see a change in these policies or the, system, or the system made, or do we expect the present system to go on? I'm in no way conflating the liberal order with the United States. The United States is receding its role, but at the same time, being the hegemon, it has had an effect. <coughs> this, um, I think Mr. Bantas, if you can answer this question. Um, so sorry, just can I paraphrase the question? Are you, are you asking whether you see this, whether I see this or we see this liberal world order as a permanent state of affairs or do you think it's going to be replaced by? No, my question is considering the fact that all nations like China, Russia and various other nations are accepting the very political and, political and economic institutions which were framed by the United States and the West back in 1945 do they consider any change of policies in the near in the near future because they have all different values and from and different understandings of where they come from? Well, I'm not sure I would accept necessarily the premise that they have different values. 
And I, I don't, I mean, I'm not trying to be, well, I'm slightly trying to be difficult. We were in an academic environment, so I'd be a bit provocative. Um, I don't know what that means. I mean, they have bought into this system. China, for example, is now a one of the more sizable contributors to UN peacekeeping missions. Um, that's a direct consequence of it, the expansion of, of its power uh, and influence um, the world over. Um, it realizes, uh, again, to um, take up what, what Andy said, that as you become more powerful, certain responsibilities uh, lie with that. Now, I, I don't wish to say it's as simplistic as that, but again, I think you know what I hope you will drill down on as you ask the question over the next few days is, is the liberal world order ending? What do we mean by the liberal world order, and which bits of it actually mightn't we be uh, not too unhappy about saying goodbye to? Um, uh, if indeed it is ending. I think there is an assumption behind these questions that what we have is good as a sort of homogenous whole. And I would really urge you to query whether that is uh, in, in fact the case. So whether it's the US or China being the dominant force in, uh, in, in world affairs, I don't really have, personally, any strong views on that. What I think we want to have to do, what we want to do is set in, put in place a system of checks, yeah, hopefully, so that the power of whoever is the dominant force could not be um, uh, total, and frameworks through which we can cooperate. That's essentially what multilateral is, what multilateralism is. Good evening, the students of the George Washington University, and I was just curious for Dr. Knight, you addressed a number of the issues that face these small island nations, ranging from economic to security threats, and particularly those presented by natural disasters. How do you see those threats going away in a sustainable way that those countries can then continue to manage on their own? Obviously, the rest of the world has a role to play in rectifying these issues in the sort of short and medium term, but as a long-term problem, you know, these countries aren't going to get more land and you know, natural disasters unfortunately won't go away, at least with current technology. How do you see these countries being sustainable and viable over the long term? That's a very good question. I, 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 I really don't know if I have the answer to it as yet. Um, it reminded me of something that uh, Jonathan said in this talk, which I thought was very significant. He said that um, in, in the case of a man in migration, you have two choices, right? end migration altogether, or manage it. And I would say that while that's true, there are some countries that just don't have the capacity to manage migration. Um, you know, Trinidad is one of them. Um, you know, Venezuela is about to implode right now. There are thousands of Venezuelans coming into Trinidad, and they have no capacity to, uh, to, to at their border, to stop those individuals from coming into Trinidad. So, uh, so there, the problem is that uh, many of these issues are, like I said before, intermestic, rather than simply domestic problems or global problems. So there's a blurring of the line between the domestic and international. So I can't see a situation where these countries, facing the vulnerabilities and the threats that they face, to the point of being almost an existential threat, I can't see those countries having the capacity to deal with it on their own, or even within their own region. CHARICOM has failed to, to act in, in, a, in, a, in a proper way to deal with some of these problems regionally because it has not have the capacity to deal with it. So at the end of the day, what you're looking at is really a multilateral system. Uh, and not only a multilateral system, but a multiplex system that would, in, that would involve not just all the countries of the world getting together and trying to solve this problem collectively, but also involving non-governmental organizations, private sector organizations, private sector industries uh, to help solve some of these problems. The reality is that some of those countries that you're talking about, in the Caribbean, for example, in small islands and developing states, they no longer exist. The way we, the way we think that they, they, they are existing today. They, right now, they, they, they sometimes don't have the capacity to exist as independent states. They just 
independent states in name only, but not in a de jure, uh, in, in a de facto sense. Um, they might be a de jure a sovereign state, recognized by other states as, 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 as independent states, but de facto they're not able to uh, operate as, as independent states right now. So I, I see the possibility that some of these states will, will no longer exist, to be quite honest, uh, as viable states. That's the reality. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Elena. I'm from Brazil. I'm from Brazil. I'm from Brazil. My question is for Mrs. Cruz. Uh, I would like to know your opinion regarding the uh, United, uh, United States position on the United Nations Agreement on Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction and what can be uh, the impacts if uh, the internet is silent. I'm embarrassed to admit that I actually don't know as much about that as I should. Um, and so I don't think I can give an educated opinion on that. Um, yeah, but you know, the problem of doing that in an August room such as this is someone calls you on it. Um, so I'm sorry that I, that I can't help you out as much on that. You know what I might do though, since I have a mic, is I may throw out an answer to a, to this, a partial answer to some of the questions that, I, that I've heard, and I'm sorry that's less helpful to your question. But when, some, when we're talking about like the death of the world order and, and the challenges that that is and, and what is going to replace it and what happens with, with China and Russia potentially rising, um, something that we, one of my colleagues has done a lot of work on, David Victor, who's with Brookings in UC San Diego, is um, the idea that even though these are multilateral huge global problems, you don't necessarily need huge global groups to make progress. Um, I mean, we see sort of smaller groups of countries like the G7 and the G20, and we're all really comfortable with those. Um, there are a lot of instances where smaller groups of countries and even subnational groups can actually make progress. The migrants, on environmental issues, they can be um, laboratories for innovation, they can do some proof of concept on different things. And so you actually don't need everybody to agree through the UN process, because it's so hard to get people to agree on anything through the UN process. Everybody, like everybody's goals are so different in their, in their national interests. So. This is a. I feel like I've been a, a little somber up here, but this is one really positive thing for me: is that we don't all have to agree on how to fix something. If you get enough people to move something forward, you can learn a lot from doing it. They can make some progress, and you can learn what works. And so it doesn't relate as much to your question, but it also maybe harkens back to it may not be the end of the world if the U.S. doesn't sign something. If there are enough groups co cooperating, enough countries, enough subnationals, the people that matter that it may not be the end of the world if any one country doesn't do something, even if it's a hedge fund like the United States is. If enough people are doing the right thing, you will go progress. Optimism. <laughs> so my name is Uzair. I'm a member of the Epic Program. Um, my question is rest is tremendous, and it's sort of along the lines of the capacity of managing migration. Um, there's this notion in political discourse, especially in America, that if we allow refugees to come here, there are, there are going to be some that slip through the cracks and do all sorts of things that you know, they shouldn't. But what isn't being told is the process of becoming a legal refugee. It's one of the hardest processes to obtain a refugee status in the United States. It takes between 18 to 24 months. It's harder than any other visa process that you can get. And so, my question would really be, how do you flip this whole notion um, and, and, and flip it to baseline facts and not rhetoric that is either it is either established through fear or, or through any other issue? And how is how, how can you play that into, into the discourse amongst the American people? It's a great question. Actually, it's, I mean, it's a brilliant question because it helps me to finish off my comments. Um, and, 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 it, and in fact, it, you know, I think it plays into a, a strand that permeates all, all three of our presentations in that essentially it requires leadership. And that, I, I, I don't mean that in a glib way, because leadership, well, I think one of the most difficult aspects of leadership is to put in particularly for liberal world order who tend to be um, uh, operating in democracies, 
who have to put in place policies that outlast the electoral cycles. So they cannot, they are both prey to a popular, a media popular uh, views, but also must transcend them. As with my uh, 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 boss in, uh, in, in Europe, I will keep it anonymous and having a meeting with a senior cabinet official um, who was explaining how she understood what needed to be done on um, uh, migration, but you know, doing that now would be electoral suicide. My boss said with sort of mock naivety, I'm sorry, I thought uh, uh, government officials always operated in the public interest, to which this government official shot back immediately, it is in the public interest that I'm re-elected. Um, uh, 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 but, uh, um, the, I mean, but this highlights, I think, the central challenge that they have, this short versus long term. But I think there are some things that you can do in the short term. And, and, and one of those really revolves around the responsible use of rhetoric. Uh, and we see rhetoric used either subconsciously or, sadly, not so subconsciously, irresponsibly, um, all the time. You know, one of my favourites, I used to spend a lot of my career working in, in the conflict field, was uh, one of my favourites was the reference to innocent civilians, uh, uh, as, if, <laughs> as if somehow there's another category of civilians out there whom we can bomb a little bit. Uh, um, uh, uh, but, but you really see this in spades when you're talking about uh, migration. I mean, I don't think I refer to swarms and queue barges. I mean, this is the, really the pejorative end um, of, um, uh, of, of the discourse. Conflating traffickers and smugglers is, a, is, another, is another one. Referring to countries as countries of origin or countries of destination is another. It implicitly places the onus or the burden on the country of origin. You are sending your problems to us, the innocent country of destination, ignoring the reality, in fact, that countries are the same, that both at one and the same time, they are countries of origin, destination, and transit more often, uh, 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 frankly, that they're not, and also economic and illegal migrants are, are two of my bugbears. Uh, if you don't pay tax, you're not an illegal citizen. Uh, so why you suddenly your whole personality becomes illegal because of the administrative status uh, by which you're in a country it is lost on me. Uh, and it is very dangerous. It leads to a very difficult environment in which you can have a constructive debate around the type of needs that your society has in terms of, of, of labor being the most obvious one. Refugees, which was your subject, is, uh, which was the, the, the focus of, of your question, I changed it to migrants, is slightly different because of course they have a legal status. You, you, they have, there is an obligation to provide them with protection. The more complicated one are migrants, where there is no such obligation, but your society needs them in any event. Good evening, my name is Lisa Hemane. I'm a student at Trinity College Dublin and I'm studying international peace studies. Dr. Knight, you were mentioning a very important point about um, the unclarity and lack of responsibility. Um, especially when we talk about migration and um, climate change and the refugee crisis. I think it's inseparable from a lack of empathy. And I was wondering, um, because this is a multi level task. How would you suggest to redevelop empathy on this um, certain levels, and especially on the political sphere, um, where the political leaders decide what is right or wrong, or what the next act will be? And um, I actually do believe that with empathy or redeveloping the feeling of empathy, the responsibility comes. And I wanted to know um, what your opinion about empathy and responsibility is. That's a very thoughtful question. I think 
And it's thoughtful because um, we're living in a, at a time, I think, when there's not a lot of empathy being shown by some of the leaders um, in this country, I should say. I have to be very careful, I'm not a, a US citizen, so <laughs> be very careful. But that, I think that there's a, a problem with that, that if you have leadership that don't demonstrate empathy, uh, you can see it starting to somehow infect the rest of the society too, and start to see others also displaying the same lack of empathy throughout society. I think, I think you raise a very valid point, and it goes back to the point of, I think, that uh, international relations have tried to steer away from the notion that um, ethics and morality matters, right? Uh, there's, there are th those who are of the opinion that ethics and morality don't really matter when it comes to international relations, that what really matters is interest. <clears throat> the national interest matters, not ethics, not morality. I think we have to bring morality and ethics back in. In the same way that, uh, uh, who was it, so I talked about bringing the state back in. Uh, you know, we have to bring back some of those, 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 those sort of underlying principles of ethics, morality, empathy, back into society and back into the dis discourse on international relations. And I, I believe it has to start with the leadership in this, from some of these countries, um, embracing the notion of empathy, um, and hopefully help, help to infect the rest of the society that this is the way to go. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's where we'll start. Um, it answered a part of it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm still wondering and struggling with finding an attempt to how we actually bring the world to realize this um, important task. I think maybe we have to start electing local leaders who have empathy. In other words, we have to start voting those without empathy out of office. Maybe that's one way to do it. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kamen Guar. I'm a senior at Tufts University. I'm in the Epic Club, and I study international relations in Russia. Um, my question is to Ms. Gross. Um, one, I think, really fascinating um, phenomenon that we've seen in international relations recently is this sort of subtle ascension of sub-state actors. So non-federal, non-national governments sort of taking the stage um, on, in international relations. We see that with um, um, Xi Jinping visiting California's Jerry Brown. We see that with the sort of visceral reaction of um, citizens of London reacting against Brexit. Um, given the role that uh, sub-state actors like city governments, even townships, but on the broader scale, state governments, province governments, play in the uh, climate crisis, especially considering the fact that things like emissions, emission standards, building codes, urban planning, those are all regulated at the sub-national level. What role do these governments play and what can they do to uh, transcend sort of the national rhetoric, the national politics surrounding uh, climate change, uh, particularly in the United States right now. Uh, you are right, and you actually included part of what I was planning to, to answer your question within your question. Um, it is entirely true that a lot of policies that are really important to emissions, and I'll talk about subnationals and climate because that's sort of where my knowledge base is. Um, a lot of the things, um, building codes, how grids are set up and operated, those are all at the subnational level. And so subnationals have a lot of say in how the U.S. complies with its climate goals. And it's funny, a different talk that I've given to a different audience where I've tried to sort of raise some optimism about, not so much about our withdrawal, but about the effect of our withdrawal. One of the things that makes our withdrawal less bad environmentally is that a lot of the decisions that need to be made are not federal. Um, and so what you'll see is that you won't see an entire, you know, a strong drop off in our emissions reductions efforts, in our clean energy efforts, because a lot of these are just not federal decisions. Um, what will happen, which is a little bit more challenging, is that you'll see more divergence among states. And I, I spoke to some California officials a few weeks ago, and one of the things that they're thinking about a lot in California, I mean, as you see, they're pushing hard. Um, and good on them for doing it, and they're trying new things and seeing what works, and that's good for the world in a lot of ways. But it may become challenging for them, and they're starting to think about this, is if they get way ahead of everyone else, they start to have a lot of edge effects, competitiveness effects, um, effects of rather than reducing emissions, they're sort of moving emissions around. 
like, okay, fine, well, we won't do that in California anymore, we'll do it in another state. And so this, I think, gets challenging, not just with subnational actors in the states, but in other places where there are differences of opinion in how you should deal with climate and environmental issues, that it's, a lot of these decisions are made locally, which can be helpful when you have jurisdictions that feel very strongly about them and are pushing really hard. When it gets challenging is when you don't have the federal sort of setting the floor and you get two disparate policies, that you start to have um, migration of emissions and edge effects around the states and that's when it starts to get challenging and that's where you start to need the center to sort of set some boundaries and keep those effects from getting too big. And so, but when I talk about this and talking about our lab internationally, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm almost playing psychiatrist and saying, no, it's not this bad environmentally. And that's one of the things that I point out is that a lot of these decisions are not federal. And also a lot of business decisions are not changing. We were talking, I was talking with a couple of folks about this at dinner tonight. And when you look at energy companies making decisions, um, four -year, a four-year administration, when you're thinking about a 40-year project, is peanuts. They're not changing how they make decisions, even for investments in the US, because their decision horizon is much longer than this administration. And when they think about what's happening, they don't make these decisions based on a four-year administration. They look at the way the whole world is going, and they make decisions differently. So that's, again, optimism. That's a little bit of optimism around our withdrawal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, I'm Nikolai, from uh, the University of Moscow. Uh, well, uh, when we speak about the river of all children, we do this uh, meaning that uh, uh, usually uh, private actors, they are more important problem, including the more important problem. And uh, Dr. Knight, you mentioned uh, uh, like that private sector, private sector actors should uh, contribute more uh, to the development, uh, to, uh, well, uh, to the uh, tackling problems of small uh, violent states and these developments and developed uh, states. So could you please uh, expand a little bit on that and maybe uh, you can give some examples of, uh, of patterns of some big me mechanisms that uh, private companies, transnational companies, uh, are engaged in, uh, like, uh, in uh, the in solving in solve these problems. Like, uh, I'm now uh, working in Moscow uh, in the office and they're sending me to Istanbul, uh, a regional hub, saying I'm going to work uh, on a private, uh, public, public private uh, corporation in the sphere of uh, like de development. And I learned what, I'm, what projects uh, we are working on, and they say, like, well, we don't really know. The only example we can recall is like this climate goals that then we send to schools, uh, which is to use it uh, to mainstream like climate knowledge to the students. Well, it's, uh, not really impressive, no? So it's like important, but it's not uh, like, uh, doesn't really change the situation. Maybe you know, you know some like good examples of private companies uh, contributing to, to the solution of this problem. Thank you. That's a, that's a very good question, actually. And um, again, it goes back to my conception, uh, but not my conception, but really, actually Amitabhacharya's conception of the multiplex of world order in which uh, you're looking at many different types of players, not just uh, states, not state actors, but also private uh, commercial firms and private security firms and so on, getting involved in decision making and helping to to, uh, to solve certain types of problems. It really brought me back to what Sam had to say about um, uh, like-minded groups of actors, right, working together on a problem. You don't need to have the entire globe working on it. but. Uh, a, a few like-minded actors, and those actors don't necessarily have to be a few like-minded states. It could be, a, it could be the states in combination with uh, non-state actors. And I can think of a couple of examples. Um, I think of the audible process. Have you ever heard of the audible process? To ban landmines? In a treaty that was signed to ban landmines. Okay, so Canada took the lead on this. I remember the foreign minister was Lloyd Asworthy at the time. And Canada took the lead, but you know what he did? He didn't get a lot of buy-in uh, to, 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 to create this process to ban landmines from states within the UN system. He had, he had a difficult time getting the US, UN system members to be part of this. So what he did was involve non-state actors, companies, businesses that were involved in 
grass creates, helping to create the landmines in the first place. And he brought them together in Ottawa. That's what's called the Ottawa process. He brought in academics. I was one of the academics. I was a junior academic at the time. So he brought in academics. He brought in uh, people from the private sector. And what he did was create a, a coalition of actors that had the same uh, mindset wanted to ban these despicable weapons that do more damage after wars are over than even during the wars. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's really despicable what, what people can do with those landmines. And the United States, as, an, as, a, as a primary actor in international affairs, didn't want to be part of this at all. But guess what? I think in large part, because of the efforts of those, that combination of different actors, the U.S. actually started to abide by some of the measures that are in that landmines treaty, right? So I think it have a, a, a way of sort of moral suasion sometimes on, on, on countries that may not want to be part of that kind of deal and eventually force them into, or shame them maybe into, into being part of that, that process. So that was just one example you can think of off the top. But it, it, it is, it, this is an evolving issue. So um, you have to sort of find the case studies and sort of look at them in more detail and see which ones are working. I know that the, um, the efforts to, um, to stop the, uh, the trade in small arms and light weapons is also attracting uh, companies and private sector actors uh, into that process as well. So there are a few examples that I can point to like that. Uh, this panel. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. I really, I hope you've enjoyed this thought-provoking discussion. I know some of you have. You know, you're a little sleepy. I guess you're just weighed down by the intellectual <laughs> knowledge and learning you've just learned. <laughs> um, um, anyway, the, the symposium will continue tomorrow at Lane Hall at room 100. Uh, the next panel will be um, the changing social contract, the globalized economy, and technology in the 21st century. Uh, that's tomorrow in Lane Hall at room 100 at 12.30. Um, hope to see you all there, and thank you again for coming.